Hey everyone, no intro going on today. Things are going to be a little bit different now that I'm kind of working this show, Strange Paradigms, around my summer school classes and my work schedule. Today's show will only be about an hour instead of an hour and a half. No co-host, no intro. Let's just get straight into the news. First, hello to everyone watching this live super early on the West Coast average time on the east coast i'm so happy all of you can make it and you are aware of the updated time so yesterday we had some pretty big news drop it down up here in the ufo community and what was that well that was nasa having a teleconference what so i watched it actually hours after it aired live because of work and prepping for my show yesterday And uh, it was pretty interesting. Right off the bat, before we get into it, before we get hit all the little pieces of it, did any of you watch the NASA teleconference talking about them creating a UAP committee? Which, it seems that the term UAP is fluctuating between a singular and a uh, plural word. Some saying unidentified um, aerial phenomenon and then phenomena. In NASA's case, they are saying it is it is a phenomena, calling it UAPs. Now it's become plural for them, along with we also heard that pretty frequently in the uh, conference that happened in May. So I think I think we're learning as we go on if it's plural or singular, but in this matter it doesn't really matter at all mark tasaka thank you so much for the super sticker again hello to everyone coming in so let's for those that haven't seen or haven't watched listened to the teleconference but let's let's get into that so yesterday may 9th Members of NASA said they are going to study UAPs for nine months starting in the fall. And okay, so that was pretty interesting right off the bat. Then you had Spurgle, the lead and president of the Simons Foundation, said he intends to go into the study with no preconceived notions and that he is open to the idea that UAPs could have several different explanations. But they do believe that these UAPs are not do not have extraterrestrial origin so that that one sentence right there how did that make you feel when you were listening to the teleconference or if you're listening to it right now with me uh, (laughs) raw in this case for them to say oh we don't think that uaps have an extraterrestrial origin what are your thoughts on that for for myself i'm thinking Hmm. Hmm. That those are my thoughts. Like, just like stroking my white beard that I don't have, but mentally I do have. So they went ahead and continued stating, like I said a little bit earlier, that this is going to be a nine-month study, and they will be looking at how to best collect future data on UAPs. And this report will be made public. That is key now how much of that report will be redacted well we won't know until we get that report it is so great to see viewers here from around the world sweden netherlands welcome for those watching this live say hello and then also say where you're coming from I I think it's so fantastic to see everyone participating from around the globe being interested in this subject. Hello, hello. So let's continue with this article. And let me go ahead and just kind of, that is not the right picture. Share the screen of the NASA logo. Here it is. NASA. Fantastic. So. It continues, and here is one pretty interesting quote. It says, NASA is commissioning a 
study team to start early in the fall to examine unidentified aerial phenomena, UAPs. They put that in quotes on the NASA website. Then it continues. That is, observations of events in the sky that cannot be identified as aircraft or known natural phenomena. From a scientific perspective, the study will focus on identifying uh, available data, how best to collect future data, and how NASA can use that data to move the scientific understanding of UAPs forward. Once again, that came from the NASA website directly. Todd, thank you so much. It says thanks. No, thank you, my friend. Thank you. <laughs> hey, nerds, I'm in Utah. I, after doing the show on Utah, I cannot wait to go to Utah. Hello from Wales. Nice. I do like um, fish and chips and British bangers. Those are delicious. And obviously a cup of tea. I'm not drinking tea. I'm having some really good coffee right now with Starbucks caramel macchiato creamer. That is the best creamer. And you know, like your average creamers at the store are actually made out of like vegetable oil. Yeah, that's kind of grody. This one's made out of like milk and literally pure sugar, pure sugar. So the website continues. It says the limited number of observations of UAPs currently makes it difficult to draw scientific conclusions about the nature of such events. Unidentified phenomena in the atmosphere are of interest for both national security and air safety. We've heard this a bunch of different times. And it seems that even NASA is taking that stance as well. David, thank you so much for the super sticker. Thank you. It then continues stating, establishing which events are natural provides a key first step to identifying or mitigating such phenomena, which aligns with one of NASA's goal to ensure the safety of aircraft. So I do want to keep in mind, this is important to mention when dealing with NASA, that they are funded by the government, okay? This is a practically a, a government type of company. So for them to take the stance on looking at this as a potential threat, I believe is only natural for them to do, again, because they are kind of side and side with the government on this. So here's a really important thing to mention that they state it says the agency is not part so their their uap committee is not part of the department of defense's unidentified aerial phenomenon task force the uaptf or the successor the aoi msg nasa has however coordinated widely across the government regarding how to apply the tools of science to shed light on the nature and origin of unidentified aerial phenomena okay so we we kind of got like the gist of this 45 minute teleconference and even looking at the nasa website as well that statement right there of them stating look we're not working with the uaptf we're not working with aoy msg do you feel and i'm asking this in the live chat and i want your honest response to this do you think that is a good thing that they're kind of an independent group studying this or do you think it's like ooh, they're going to keep keeping these types of secrets even though there will be a public report that should be coming out in about nine months after the fall even though a bunch of it might be redacted is this a good thing that they are an independent group for myself <laughs> For myself, um, I want to hope it's a good thing. When I was listening to the teleconference, there were two things that came to mind. One of them being, hmm, I wonder what Avi Loeb, the Harvard professor that is running the Galileo project, thinks about this. Is he happy about this or, or not? And I definitely, I don't have his phone number, but I would love to call him and, and ask and ask him this specific question because obviously he was listening to this so that was definitely one of my questions what are his thoughts on this andrew thank you so much uh david said they will still keep the secrets 
Yeah, I mean, I hope they don't. I'm I'm really looking forward to this report that will be made public on their study after nine months. Because they did end up stating that they're going to be looking at civilian cases, military cases, company cases, and government cases as well. So we will see how that turns out. And uh, Chris says, I'm encouraged by Bill Nelson more forthcoming attitude than what we've had in the past. Yeah, he's he's been... He's been much in the public eye recently, maybe like the last since November, since the um, Our Future in Space conference, and obviously a little bit before that. But I feel like that conference in particular, he really did come forward and and drop some proverbial crumbs here and there. And for those that are interested in this topic, kind of have a special ear to these types of things. Now, for your average person, it's kind of like, oh, yeah, this is kind of boring. Like, what's the point of this? But for us in this community, been so enthralled in it for quite some time or even for a year, let's say, such as myself, uh, we we just kind of have our ears perked to certain keywords or how things are asked and how things are answered as well. So with Bill Nelson, I have to agree with you on that. Um, with what he's been saying lately, I do hope that he is pro having this public report not be redacted at all, just like untouched. <laughs> that would be fantastic. But that is my hopeful dream. Will that be the case? Again, we simply will not know until we have that report in our hands. It was kind of like the other report that we got last year in June, the UAP preliminary report. We got a very sanitized version, and apparently the real one, or the one for Congress, was a lot thicker in many respects. But, you know, at the end of the day, you know, I'm not expecting, I'm not expecting disclosure from NASA or the government. I'm more inclined to think that disclosure will come from the people, like maybe through another instance similar to the Phoenix Lights, or here's where I would take my bets. At Skinwalker Ranch. Here is why I say that. So there are multiple locations across the globe that are similar to Skinwalker Ranch. However, Skinwalker Ranch is getting scientists coming through, doing experiments. They have a TV show. Now they have where now they have uh, the cameras that are open to the public that they can watch the ranch with Eric Bard that scans through it every single day, all hours of the day. Skinwalker Ranch is becoming incredibly public with their information. And so with that being said, they're a lot more open than what the government or NASA has been for the last 70 years, right, the government, and uh, maybe even after that. So that is kind of where my thoughts lie on this, that disclosure is going to be coming from the people at the end of the day. Now, where exactly? Well, I'm telling you, I'm hedging my bets on Skinwalker Ranch. Let's jump in to our next article. Again, we are moving through this rather quickly just because today's show is only going to be about an hour instead of an hour and a half, and we have a lot to cover. Now, before I do continue on that, this this kind of makes me like a little antsy because the government is supposed to be working for us, paid by our tax dollars. And let me tell you, I have a crazy tax story for you that I'm not going to share today. Yet it gives us nothing more than smoke and mirrors. And I'm thinking, why am I paying my taxes if I'm not getting what I need? what I want and what I think that we deserve as a as a global community. Well, I we'll see what happens in the future on this. Because I'm I'm optimistic. I am optimistic in a lot of the things, but in this case, maybe not so much. And when it comes to NASA, they owe us the truth. They absolutely do. And they have some pretty fantastic and very interesting projects. Okay, one more thing that I do want to mention that I actually wrote a note on that I feel is very important. And that is 
this teleconference was released on their NASA video channel, which has about 800,000 subs. However, when I looked at it last night, the stats, the views, it only had 2,000 views. Now, on the other side, NASA has another channel, a YouTube channel called NASA, and it has 10 million subs. They get they get pretty decent stats, and they did not share the teleconference on their main YouTube channel. Was that intentional? They just make a mistake? Something else entirely? Is that NASA channel just not for live content, such as the teleconference? So they instead put it on the NASA video channel that only has 800,000 subs instead of 10 million? Uh, mm. That was my issue there. And again, it only from when I checked last night, I'm not sure what the stats are this morning, but from what I checked last night, it only had about 2,000, 3,000 views in total. That is very disappointing for such a big, a big teleconference such as this one where NASA is stating, yeah, we are going to make a UAP committee. We're going to study this and we're going to make it public. Man, I don't know. And the live stream was unlisted too. Thank you, Door to Nothingness. Also, very cool name. See, it's it's these little details that I think we need to keep our eye on. Uh, these little these little tidbits. Why is this going on? Well, I'm really not sure. Logan says. There's some really big announcements coming in the UAP world soon, and I'm hoping NASA is trying to soften the beach, so to speak, so the announcement didn't hit as hard. That is some pretty good critical thinking, and, and I'm, I'm kind of on the boat with you on that. When you're dealing with NASA having their own committee, I can just imagine something big happening, for instance, and uh, the government's like, Go, go go ask NASA. Go they know what they're doing and they're gonna they're gonna push all the blame onto NASA. So uh like with, with yourself, Logan, I'm having that same kind of mindset. Now what will that news be? Hopefully it is something big. I mean the last few big dr big drops we've been getting have been kind of like duds in my opinion of course still incredibly exciting but nothing like whoa this is the best thing ever this is the smoking gun. We have not seen the smoking gun yet in the UAP community. Not at all. Here is the next article, and it is by Science Alert. I really like this website. I really do. It's such a fantastic one. For those that don't know it, I do recommend that you book bookmark it. Oh, we don't want this ad. This one's pretty cool, and I feel like we should bring it up today. And that is huge four day work week experiment that begins in the UK, the largest ever conducted. And uh, so it's pretty much stating, let's only work four days a week. Why work five? Let's do four days a week. And I am all for that. I want everyone to have a four-day work week. And we're going to go into the stats because this test has actually been done before in New Zealand uh, back in 2018. And it had such good results. You had employees being more energized. They were more productive. They were less stressed. And they were just ready to work. So let me kind of go ahead and read you the summary of this article. And then we're going to get into the previous research experiments that have been conducted to go ahead and practically inspire this one happening in the UK. So for thousands of lucky people, the work week is now only four days long, and you're still going to get paid 100% of your regular income. And even though you've gained an entire day of extra personal time, now, it was estimated to be the largest four-day work week experiment ever conducted, dealing with 70 companies and over 3,300 employees in the UK are definitely embracing the work-life balance shift. And as part of a pilot program to trial the four-day work week arrangements, it will be going on for six months. Can you imagine? Six months of only working four days a week. Ooh, I, yes, 
if, if you had white hair, you're going to have less white hair starting from this point on if you are part of one of these 3,000 employees going under this study. So the initiative spearheaded by nonprofit Four Day Week Global, alongside other organizations, is beginning to run in conjunction with researchers from Cambridge University, Oxford University, and Boston College. And they will investigate how a four day work week will impact the workers. So there was one uh, economic, economic, eco, anyways, a sociologist who said, We'll be analyzing how employees respond to having an extra day off in terms of stress and burnout, job and life satisfaction, health, sleep, energy use, travel, and many other aspects. So they are looking at a lot of different things during this six-month experiment. And let, 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 let's back up a little bit. From the information that you have so far that I have just shared with you, would you want to be one of these participants? Would you want to be like, yeah, I want to be researched and studied on and see how I react to a four-day work week because I would raise my hand. Getting paid still 100% of your income, but having four days instead of working four instead of five, that is, that is an awesome idea. And you'll also be working about 35 hours a week as well. So many workers expressed that after starting to work a fewer hours, they felt better, more energized, and less stress, resulting in them having more energy for other activities such as exercise, friends, and hobbies. So it's they pretty much have this concept called the 180-100 model, meaning workers get 100% of their pay, work 80% of the time in exchange for 100% productivity. Ooh, that is very cool. And some think the transition may be only a matter of time, echoing modern society's adaptation of the five-day work week in the early decades of the 20th century, which involved eliminating a six-day of work. Remember, back in the day, you only had one day of rest. Now, in present day, you have two. Well, maybe in the future, we might get three. <laughs> Rich says it won't last just wait until we become less productive than the Far East. Hopefully that is not the case. I mean, like I had mentioned, this study has already been done in 2018 in New Zealand. However, it was only conducted with about 200, um, 250 employees for, um, I think, only like two months instead of six months. So I, I feel like if we just look at present day, I feel like we've been more productive having a two-day weekend versus just having one. But also life in the 21st century, particularly since, let's say, 2010 onward, it's been a different type of, of stress in our life. Let's go back into the early 1900s, 1800s, and before then. You were, you were cultivating the land. You were doing a lot of work with your hands, but it didn't necessarily require a lot of brain power. Now we're on social media all day and people were poor back then as well. So they were really required to do a bunch of incredibly hard labor. Everything was a struggle. So if you only worked five days a week instead of six, that was going to affect your entire family. That's not necessarily the case this as much anymore. And the industrial revolution really got things going with having working less days and making life a little bit easier. But let's say we have another day off. I feel like I feel like overall it might be better for the public. Now how they will use their time is up to them. As we are aware, social media just eats up like your entire life. So we'll just kind of have to play it by ear on if this will be panned out for the entire globe. And there is the issue of the population explosion, right? There's there's a 
a glut of workers <laughs> to do jobs. But the, but the pandemic also changed the dynamic a lot and people began working from home. I mean, it's kind of what we're doing here today. So we'll just kind of have to see how this all plays out. On a side note, I caught another article. It's still kind of related to this one where um, California released a law that will go into effect this July that high school will now start at 8.45 a.m. instead of having classes at 7 or 8 a.m. <clears throat> Here is why. Teens require about 10 hours of sleep during their stages of puberty. So starting school later has already been tested to improve their cognitive skills, their grades, and their attendance as well. Um, I wish I could start school at 8.45 back in when I was in high school or middle school or even elementary school because waking up early and then and then forced to have breakfast and then get to school is incredibly difficult. There were a lot of times where I actually skipped breakfast because I just didn't have the time to eat it and then make it to class on time. And I know I'm not the only one on that one. I So sometimes I would like pack a snack in my backpack. That would save me from, you know, fainting literally in the middle of class. <laughs> Baby Goat says, the struggle was real. Oof. What? No way. It's 9 a.m. in the UK until 3. I have to ask, how is the, the uh, grades and the cognitive skill there in that aspect when you're dealing with working at a later time? Because I am, 9 a.m. is, I think, a fantastic, fantastic time to start class. You can wake up, take a shower, have breakfast, and you can like either walk or drive to school or on a bus and like take your time. So I like that very much. And it seems that this work schedule and this school schedule are kind of working hand in hand in this respect, where you're having a four day work week, and then you're having school start a little bit later in California. Now we'll see if the rest of the country in the United States will be getting that as well. Uh, I failed my first class because I didn't show up too early. Logan, I feel that. I, I want to tell you a quick story because when it's just me and you, I can take my time doing story time. So back in high school, my senior year in high school, my first period was in was an economics class. I'm in college now, so I don't take morning classes anymore after my freshman year. But I had this one teacher. She was the worst. She was also late to class every single morning because this was like an 8 a.m. class. And she wouldn't start class until after she finished putting on her makeup in front of everyone. And this one time I like walk over and I had a question about, I don't know, something about an exam or something. And she's putting on her lipstick. And she's like, don't interrupt me. I'm putting on my lipstick right now. You can wait until I'm done. And I'm thinking, okay, I'm just not going to show up to class. I'm just going to barely pass it. And we're going to go from there because that was very unnecessary. Thank you so much. And uh, from then on, she's always been called lipstick teacher ever since that day in my brain right here. Lipstick teacher. So yes, 8 a.m., 7 a.m. classes are insane, not just for the students, but apparently even for the workers as well. Zenza, <laughs> what kind of teacher is that? I had the same question. What's even weirder is that she would flirt with the male students because they were 18, you know, they were legal age. Um, yeah, it was very cringy. It was very gross. And I did not, did not like that class. She didn't like me. I didn't like her. So it was a mutual dislike. Let's get into the next article, <laughs> Margie. Just terrible. I know. But also being a teacher is incredibly difficult, especially when dealing with high school kids that feel so entitled. So I don't agree with her actions. However, it is not, it's not easy being a teacher. This next article happened on June 6th, and that's the Queen's Platinum Jubilee Celebration. And apparently, a UFO was seen. We are going to play that video. But first, I did not know what... I'm not British, so I didn't know what a Platinum Jubilee was. I went ahead and Googled it, and I know I'm not the only one that didn't know what this was. So I'm going to go ahead and read it to you. 
So Jubilees mark a major milestone in the reign of a monarch, celebrating their life and service. The naming of these celebrations follows the traditions of wedding anniversaries. Um, you even have 50 years of reign being a gold jubilee, 60 years of reign being a diamond, and 70 years being a platinum jubilee. So um, the queen became the very first British monarch to celebrate a platinum jubilee, marking 70 years of service. So I thought that was pretty cool. Now let me go ahead and play the video. You're not going to be able to hear the audio on this. So just bear with me. And for those listening on podcast format, jump over to YouTube so you can watch the video if you are not familiar with it. Okay, here it goes. You're able to see the planes and you're able to see this weird object just going through. And this object was actually caught by someone watching it uh, on television. Let's play it one more time. And if you look at it, it looks like a sphere which we covered yesterday on Mysteries with a History. So go ahead and also watch that episode talking all about spheres from across the world and people sighting on it. I actually saved this particular story for today. I didn't want to share it yesterday. <laughs> but yes, this object very much did look like a sphere. Oh, 70 years of what? Of ruling the country. That that is what is for. Oh, Michael, I saw it live. Okay, I'm really happy you brought that up, Michael. So I went ahead and I looked. And I'm like, how many people watched this, this celebration live? So on MSN and on Yahoo.com, they said about 11 to 13 million people watched the celebration on Saturday. So I'm, I'm taking a step back. Let's take a, t a step back just for a moment. If you were a UFO of any kind, doesn't even matter, what would be the best place to get as many people's attention as possible? Obviously, you're going to hit a very high population sighting uh, celebration like this one. That didn't make sense what I said, but you know what I mean, where you have a lot of people's eyes on an event. This this celebration in particular, where you're having anywhere from 11 to 13 million people watching, that is a great place to show yourself if, <laughs> if you want to get people's attention, having it be an alien craft or something else entirely. It doesn't matter. Let's put that aside. You want as many eyes on you as possible. Where are you going to go? You're going to go here. And that, I was like, hmm, very interesting. Now, I feel like it could have been covered a little bit more, this story. Uh, there were there were a few news outlets that covered it, but I feel like it could have kind of blown up again more just because you had so many people looking at this. Dave said, did multiple cameras catch it or just a single camera? That was the only video that I could find uh, attached to an article. Uh, I can probably assume that there might have been another angle on it. But when we are dealing with television, right, you only get that one main camera angle, especially when dealing with airplanes and like showing all that cool smoke and stuff. So from my knowledge, I could only find one. Are there multiple? It's very possible, but it might, might not even be open to the public. Don't know. Do not know. But it's all very cool. So how many of you watched this celebration live or how many of you watched it a little bit or I mean a little bit after it went live and what were your thoughts on seeing this object could it have been a balloon I mean some people think so and I think the that thing was kind of like tanking along with these airplanes so for it to be a balloon is kind of hard to say I mean compared to the speed of the red arrows it, it is kind of hard to brush it off as, oh, yeah, just a simple balloon, guys. Nothing to see here. Mm, I mean, it could be. We don't know. But looking at the speed of the of this object tailing, I guess, in a sense, these planes, it makes you question, what could it have really been? Shall I play the See? You say, uh, too fast to be a balloon. Totally agree on that. I'm going to go ahead and play the video one more time for you so you can kind of take a look and 
come up with your own conclusions on what you think it may be and go ahead and write them in the live chat what you possibly believe this object is. I mean, look how fast it's going. It's pretty fast. Also looks very spherical. Play one more time. Please let me know in the live chat what you think this object is. Wow. Very interesting. Very interesting. While I wait for some responses, we can jump into the next article. Sunspot says, oops, Sunspot says it does move like a UFO. 100% balloon. You can even see where it was tied. Probe. Orb. Orb like the one from the weekend before. Drone. Oops. It appeared to be a bright sphere. Ooh, and then you even had Zenza say it's zoomed in a lot, that close up, so it looks fast. And that's in air quotes. Also, a great point to make. Margie says, a light being, maybe. Foo Fighter? Well, we talked about that yesterday on the episode of Falling Spheres on Mysteries with a History. Could it be? Possibly. Someone else says it's similar to the UFO flying next to Concord. Possibly. I am liking all of these different ideas on what this object could be because at the end of the day, we just don't know. Would I love to know? Yes, I would love to know, but I don't. Okay, let's jump into the next article. This one was written by Vice and it blew my mind on what I learned on this, but let's get into it. Let me go ahead and share the screen. What is this? I don't want to show this. No, I don't want to show that ad. Oh, well. So years of early alien hunting data are at risk of being lost forever. And I'm kind of scrolling down the article just a little bit for you to catch a whiff of what it's about but we're going to get into it okay thank you for that ad we don't we don't need any of those ads so let's go ahead and read the summary of this article so at the turn of the millennium millions of people embarked on an epic search for intelligent life outside of our planet the platform was seti at home a public program run by the berkeley seti research center that invited volunteers to analyze astronomical images and flag unusual radio signals that might indicate an otherworldly intelligence it rapidly became one of the most successful civilian scientist projects of all time, linking more than a million computers across more than 230 countries. How many of you have heard of SETI at home? This was news to me. I had never heard of this. I've heard of SETI, obviously, and we're going to get into that a little bit later. But SETI at home, having volunteers look at data, no, that was so new. And this started in 1999. I feel like we need to talk about this more. Oh, Skyhawk says, I participated in SETI at home for years. You are still able to participate in it. You are able to download the program onto your computer and comb through data if you wish. But Skyhawk, for someone that has been a part of it, what what attracted you to it? What did you like about it? And have you found anything that you believe to be remarkable or to even worth repeating? Zenza said, I had a Zeti at home account. Nice. See, I'm happy that you all know about this because I didn't. This is new to me. I used to run it on my PC. Ooh, I ran Zeti at home daily for almost 15 years. All of you people are so cool. You guys are so cool. Such nerds, and I love it. <laughs> I signed for Zeti at home back in 2001. Wow, just a few years after it, it was released. Well, I will say in 99 when it was released, I was literally born. So, yeah, I wasn't able to jump on the bandwagon when it came to the public. So, Eric... 
Kaur Pella, an astronomer and director of SETI at Home, announced that the obsolete Sun Enterprise series servers that initially linked the network were sent to Berkeley's Excess and Salvage Department and the digital linear tape, the DLT tapes, used to store the project's first six years of data would likely be discarded as well, a development he called a bittersweet milestone in a recent post on the project's forum. So he goes ahead and states in a phone call to Vice saying, these machines are no longer made by a company that no longer exists and are running on operating systems that no longer exists. So it seems like this kind of like black hole vacuum <laughs> on this aspect of it. But since his posting in March bidding farewell to the hardware, Corpella has fortunately received some interest in the items from the Large Scale Systems Museum in, in New Kingston, Pennsylvania. But their potential rescue is still far from assured as they occupy a nebulous middle age for computing technology. So old enough to be defunct, but too young to be considered ancient digital artifacts kind of heartbreaking i feel like this is such a a beautiful time you know when you're dealing with study at home and then now all this information is going to be lost forever never to be recovered makes me a little sad however they have mentioned that that with since 99 they haven't really found anything that is worth mentioning to the public so maybe just maybe losing this older information might not be as important or or we just don't have the sophisticated technology yet to maybe decipher something else entirely where that we're just not catching with the technology that we have today but maybe we are getting some type of communication we don't really know that and that's probably not the case i'm just kind of thinking outside of the box here but i i don't believe that to be necessarily true so corpella said we expected when we started in 99 to get maybe 10,000 people interested in running this but instead we got millions i guess there's something about searching for extraterrestrials that captures the public imagination in ways that trying to break a one sentence cryptid message that someone may be does not so over the course of the last two decades more than five million people searched for aliens in images captured by puerto rico's observatory which has since sadly collapsed the intense interest it attracted inspired the development of berkeley open infrastructure for network computing which is now one of the largest computing grids in the world what that is so cool and he goes ahead and he continues it says quote there are lots of signs of intelligence in our data as far as we can tell all of it so far has been human intelligence we see radars and radio stations and lots of stuff near the telescope we're still looking we're still going sifting through the data and there's a lot to look at but so far, we haven't seen any signs that E.T. is in there. And for anyone that might suspect the team is just holding out <laughs> on this information, Corpella offered a practical assurance. He said, if we had found aliens, there is no incentive to hide it because I would never have to worry about funding again. <laughs> SETI would SETI at home would still be going probably if we had found something anything <laughs> and he's not wrong there so let me ask you in the live chat if there are civilizations talking to each other out there in the universe using radio wavelengths that's pretty darn slow right but what if a civilization is advanced enough to figure out some form of quantum communication that is instantaneous how do you think it could be done and i'm and i'm asking because i often wonder if 
if quantum entanglement might hold the key to communicating instantaneously. What do you think? What do you think about that? This could be possible. While I go ahead and wait for your answers on that, because this is an open question for you, the live chat, the reason to why I have this show, Strange Paradigms, is to go over articles with you live and to hear your answers or your stories or your experiences on these types of things. So while, like I said, while I wait, uh, I will continue with this. I think that this study at home program is remarkable. And I also feel that it's incredibly important to allow the public to be involved in these findings. Once again, I am telling you, disclosure is not coming from the government or from NASA. It's going to be coming from us. Now, we have Bear 180 say subspace. Very possible. Curious George says, communication via gravity waves. That would be cool. David says, well, we can do that now telepathically and with remote viewing. So it is very possible. Hashtag collective consciousness. Door Nothingness says, MFW, not a quantum physicist, Christina. I don't even know what MFW means. I'm sorry. No, I don't know what that means. But <laughs> quantum physics is very complicated, very complex. I only know the very, very, very basics of it. And that's why we had to talk to scientists and get scientists involved in this conversation to hear their input on all of these different aspects of the UFO phenomena and even the paranormal as well. Because it seems that the more research that I've done, the more people that I've spoken to, the more stories that I've covered, there seems to be a convergence between the UFO phenomena and the paranormal. It seems that you're getting kind of both of them hand in hand, but it gets kind of brushed off and then classified as two very separate entities. But maybe they could be one of the same or at least somewhat similar. I would like to just kind of give you a very brief uh, history on what SETI is. And SETI is Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. And it's an ongoing effort to seek intelligent extraterrestrial life. SETI focuses on receiving and analyzing signals from space, particularly in the radio and visible light regions of the electromagnetic spectrum, looking for non-random patterns likely to have been sent either deliberately by technologically advanced beings. And it came into creation in 1984. David, thank you so much for the super sticker. That is so kind of you. So when it comes to SETI, METI, NASA, all of these different things, I feel that we need to talk about all of them because science has been interested in this topic for quite some time. However, the public just isn't really aware of that. So getting the public interested in it, getting scientists more involved, even more publicly as well. This is kind of a, a important foundation when it comes to this field and talking about it to our fellow people to get them interested in it very casually. I, I don't know where I told this. I think I was probably on um, with Kelly, Kelly Chase from Into the Rabbit Hole. But I had said whenever I go out, uh, I see a lot of alien merchandise, alien t-shirts, alien hats, alien tattoos that people have inked on their skin forever. I look at these things and I'm like, I'm going to strike a conversation with this person. So I'll walk up and I'll say, hey, hey, I, I like your shirt or your tattoo. What are your thoughts on aliens? Like, what do you think about them? And they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, they're so cool. They're so much better than us humans. And I'm like, in what ways? And they're like, yeah, I mean, they're just so much more intelligent. And I'm like, oh, cool. So like, what do you think about, for instance, I mean, what are some stories that you know about extraterrestrials um, that really caught your interest? Oh, man, I've always been interested in this stuff, but I don't really know too much about it. I just know that they're the absolute coolest thing ever. And I'm thinking, OK, that's a start. Being interested in it is a start. But now let's get the history and the science and everything else and let, let's work from there because you sir or ma'am are the future so we got to keep you 
involved in this. And um, I just find that it's like a little funny, just a side story on that. And uh, I, I feel that like what Chase Kletsky had said on my show last week, um, the this generation, generation uh, Z or Zoomers, we are primed for this conversation. Now it's just really knowing the history behind it or the science behind it that I find very important. And what was unbelievable and, and termed supernatural or paranormal like a century ago is now mainstream science. So our science is another, you know, in another century would probably seem like magic, right? I mean, I'm really interested in other dimensions and realities and the and the more like quantum research that gets done. And it seems that the math makes these other dimensions more likely. So it's not as clear cut as just our universe and possible entities out there. But now we have the whole thing of other realities. So this is these are really exciting times. And I don't think the UFO mystery is clearly cut just extraterrestrial. I think there is more to it, which would make which would make science sense maybe in another century and the paranormal will be normal at some point in time. Hopefully we will be alive to see it. Let's jump. Actually, I'm going to go ahead and skip this article. We only had about 10 minutes. This time flew by. Let me talk about this one. This one's pretty cool. Oh, my laptop just kind of got all weird. This one's about supercomputers. Supercomputers are a very cool. Oh, I don't know how to close that. But it says, a U.S. supercomputer just broke the exascale barrier, ranking fastest in the world. What? If you thought these other supercomputers were fast just wait until you hear the stats on this new one so pretty much the the petascale supercomputers uh, achieved a quadrillion calculations per second which is about 10 to the 15th power that's 15 zeros okay the exascale brings it to a whole new level reaching a quintillion being 10 to the 18th power operations per second. My brain can't even compute that. That is so unbearably fast. My brain is like ready to explode just talking about this. <laughs> so that's, that's pretty much the gist of the article. And supercomputers were originally used in applications related to national security, including nuclear weapon design, and um, now it's more it's used more for like aerospace, petroleum and automotive industries. So we've kind of seen it become more, I wouldn't say mainstream, but now more companies can go ahead and buy supercomputers. So uh, Seymour Cray designed the first commercially successful supercomputer in 1960. Four, and it was called the Control Data Corporation, the CDC, 6,600. And it had a single CPU and costed about $8 million, which is equivalent to about $60 million today. And it could handle 3 million flops <laughs> and used vector processors. I'm laughing at the word flops because I've actually never seen one a floppy disk never seen one but i'm going to go ahead and share my screen for those that are maybe a little bit younger than i am and for those that are older you are very familiar with these and so the very first supercomputer could hold three million that's insane amount of like these things it blows my mind it really really does so that's just a quick thing to share now I went ahead and, and did a little bit of going back in time. I did a little bit of research. And I'm like, hmm, supercomputers are very cool. But what about just regular computers, right? They were originally created just to compute math, to compute equations. That was like the base, the basics. So the very first computer allegedly was made in 1822. 
by Charles Bagbedge, but it wasn't built until 1991. Very cool. Uh, which actually like was like a, a supercomputer. Sorry. So the first supercomputer was built in 1882. And then uh, the first one wasn't really built p- for like average people until 1991. Now the first personal computer was made in 1973. But let's go back in time. So the first, first, first computer is believed to be the Abacus created by the Chinese in about 2400 BCE, which is very cool. I mean, like in today's world, I don't think that your normal person would consider an Abacus a computer. But we have to keep in mind what the original purpose of a computer is. And that is just to really crunch numbers, to do calculations, to calculate equations. That's the basics of it. So people our archaeologists and historians are stating that the abacus was the very, very first computer. Very cool stuff. (laughs) People talking about floppy disks. (laughs) Yes, I remember those floppy disks. How many, okay, this is a side question. How many, for those that have had flops in the past, how many did you have, like, that you had collected in a box or something? on average because i think you could just like you could casually buy them right and you would hold information in it i mean i'm so sorry i am not familiar with it so please forgive me if i say it incorrectly or if i don't address it correctly i'm I'm, i just don't know much about them but i would love to even though they are now outdated so we only got a few minutes left and i really really want to cover this article this one is blew my mind And it's strange, but it's not like paranormal or UFO related. So this one website is Ripley's. And this is is my favorite book as a kid, reading the Ripley's Believe It or Not books. They all have a website. And their website, they cover some pretty interesting articles that they write themselves. And this one is, research suggests mushrooms talk to each other. What? I know. Very cool. Very cool. I mean, mushrooms are cute. Um, Sometimes. Sometimes they're very dangerous. So you got to be pretty careful if you're going to pick them yourself. But it's believed by scientists that mushrooms are able to communicate amongst themselves, possibly having a vocabulary of about 50 words. Yeah, this is very cool. This is super cool. And I'm just really skimming through this because we just don't have a lot of time. But how they tested this was data was collected via using of electrodes, which were placed among the roots of these different types of mushroom varieties. And it was discovered that the pulses were not random, but ordered in a sophisticated fashion, in fact, to the degree that the coordination suggested the fungi were talking. So even though that these organisms might be considered, you know, solitary, they still have this kind of like collective mindset. So let's say they potentially feel fear or they they feel danger, they can go ahead and warn the other mushrooms, uh, potentially creating them to be less tasty and maybe even harder skin as well. This is still in the theoretical stages. They're still doing tests on this, but this is what they found so far. And it's incredibly exciting. (laughs) That is really, really cool. So it just goes to show that even plants are sentient. Some of them are able to even have a language amongst themselves. And this reminded me of a study that I read a few years back, before only like a few minutes left, where I actually read a paper and it was stating there was this scientist that had different the same plant and he was going to play different music to it classical music heavy metal and no music right the control group and it was shown that the plant that had classical music played to it for about two weeks um, grew a lot better a lot healthier than the one that had heavy metal music played to it for about two weeks which was kind of like a little bit more wilty and just it just not as healthy looking and so my dad is a has a huge green thumb he has like he has a patio just full of plants and he talks to his plants he's like hey how you doing do you need anything all right i'm gonna get you some water back and um his plants grow so amazing 
his plants are so green, so vibrant, so healthy looking. And then I'll have a plant and it, it lasts a week. My plants last a week, so I just don't have plants because I, I can't maintain them. Maybe I should talk to them more or play like some nice classical music for them, but I don't. I probably should. So last thing before we end today. Yesterday, I shared my arepa recipe and I got so many messages on social media for, for me to like send them like an actual recipe because the one I said was kind of all over the place because the way I described it to you, I don't make it like that. I have an arepa maker. It does all the hard work for me. But I got such good positive feedback on talking about food at the end of the video. I thought I would go ahead and share my favorite mushroom recipe. So mushrooms are a hit or miss for me. It's something that can be like kind of slimy. And like in certain foods, I find them very unnecessary. But other times, wow, they're delicious. So I'm going to share with you the portobello mushroom pizza recipe. So instead of having crust, you just, you just have a portobello mushroom as your base. You put your pizza sauce, you put mozzarella. You can put like, I like, I like putting basil leaves on mine and like garlic and olive oil and stuff. And, um, yeah, I just put basil on mine and then you put it in the oven for eight minutes at 400 degrees Fahrenheit. And then you have the most delicious recipe ever. And I'm going to share a link that I found in the live chat for you right now. If you want to go ahead and make this delicious recipe, it's super easy to make. It's really, really good. And especially if you want to like cut carbs from your diet or if you're on like some kind of diet of some kind of like a keto diet, I'm not. I'm just saying if you are, this is a really great alternative to bread. And it also just tastes really good if you're not on a diet. It's delicious. So I wanted to share that with you as like just to, just to be a little bit of fun. But um <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for joining the show today. I want you to participate in the show. If you come across strange news stories that would fit well with this show, please send me the news reports and links to news at strangeparadigms.com, which I will activate today, June 10th. I'm going to activate that today. So anything paranormal, UFOs, cryptids, bizarre, weird, unusual, just shoot me an email when you come across them. I think that'll be a lot of fun because I only have two pair. I only have one pair of eyes, so I could only catch so many articles in a week. So if you want to go ahead and share them with me, I will listen to them. Dan says, worryingly, the mushrooms were repeated. Our time is near. <laughs> Mushrooms are good. Well, they're a hit or miss. Mushrooms are a hit or miss for me. Uh, ooh, last thing I want to mention. Next week for Shifting the Paradigm, my guest is Jim Harold, a pioneer podcaster that talks about the paranormal. And let me tell you, he shares some pretty crazy stories. The whole time he was talking, my eyebrows were like this. What? So do not miss that episode. Make sure to ring the bell if you're watching this on YouTube so that you do not miss absolutely anything. I want to wish you all a wonderful rest of the week. And I will see you soon. Jim Harold has made over, I think, like 5,000 shows. So if you don't know who he is, check out his podcast. It is called The Paranormal Podcast. Or you can find him at Jim Harold's Campfire. Both of them are fantastic. He does have a few more. Check them all out. Uh, he's a really great storyteller. All right. I want to wish you all a wonderful week. I will see you next time. Be safe. And remember, keep your eyes on the skies. Mm -hmm.